Okay, I would like to invite the, the most important person in the session, uh, Prof. Kenneth, to share about SmartMS, uh, OER, and MOOC to uh, enhance our knowledge before our lecture starts next week. Okay. So the floor is yours, Prof. Silakan. Yeah. Terima kasih, Dr. Habiba. Terima kasih. Thank you very much for inviting us to the uh, Islamic uh, Faculty of Islamic Studies, thank you so much. Uh, it's not, it is, I'm not the most important person in the room. It is that uh, you who are the important people in the room. We are just a service center. We provide service to the university. Okay, so today, even I have to apologize because uh, I am not, uh, we are actually limited today. I'm only here today with uh, Nora, Nora Liza, and um, with Mr. Zulfadli because. Uh, our other coordinator is uh, sick with COVID with her family also. So I would like to apologize, but I will cover up all the element of the um, of the training and roadshow. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Muhammad Nur Hidayat Asbola for the Doha recital and for, for also inviting us here. I cannot remember everyone's name uh, because I can only see the screen some name, and, but I will continue with the training with your permission. Okay, so Salam Sajatra, Salam Pagi, Salam Campus Rama. I will start with the training with a slide, a little bit of slide show so that you can understand what exactly I will cover because I will cover many concepts. Now, what is the purpose of the roadshow, the objective of the roadshow? The objective of the roadshow is to understand the problem faced by the respective faculty institute. We want to understand what is the uh, uh, specific problem faced in terms of the delivery of the e-learning. Okay. Now, suppose you are from the Faculty of Islamic Studies. Most of the uh, teaching is focusing on cognitive and affective domain, affective and psychomotor also. Certain subjects are very easy to teach online, which if they have cognitive, lot of cognition, for example, philosophy, it's very easy to teach. Or for example, the uh, chemistry or biology, these are easy to teach, but some subject which involve affective domain, for example, understanding concept, reflection, then uh, going into concept deeply. This is requires more of face-to-face -face interaction and it is difficult to do in an online environment, but we try our best to assist you in doing that. Now, I will go through the things which we'll cover uh, today in the slide. So I will just share my screen, hopefully everything okay, because sometimes online, will have problem with the sharing. Can we see doctor the screen? And second. Very look. clear, Prof. Very clear. Just call me Kenneth. I'm not prof. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> That's too formal then. Okay. One second. The screen loading here. I cannot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's still loading. Yeah, loading. So what we will be discussing today before the screen starts, I will explain what we'll be discussing today. First is the system itself. The UMS learning management system from based on what I have seen through your faculties. Um, uh, content, I can see that almost all the courses have been very well developed and you have uh, met the criteria because I, we are checking the 1, 7, 3 and 2. The second thing which I will cover is the OER, the Open Educational Resources Repository. And the third one which I will cover is the, um, uh, the uh, MOOC. Okay, so I will cover three things. But for these ones, uh, for the MOOC training, it will be done separately. Okay, I will wait once from beginning it's not starting okay sure starting now it's slow on webex zoom is faster this is one of the first complaint which we get from student which says webex is slow and zoom is faster and most of the faculty also say the same thing is it the same with y'all uh, doctor Abhima? yeah because webex using so many data big data and so yeah. can uh, open their video yeah, during the lecture. Yes. So I will see. And it's quite slow. Yeah, it's slow. Now it is loading, but in yeah. still loading. Yeah, still loading. Okay. 
okay. It will not okay, clear. show the show. I just show the slide, okay? And I will give the slide to you later. Okay, so I, I have to show the slide. Like, can you see now the slide? Yeah, yeah, bro. I yeah. cannot show the show. I'm sorry. I will have to show like this because the net is slowing down. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh -huh. Now, what we will cover in today's uh, road show is the UMS learning management system first. I will guide you through the system and the processes which we go through the system. When we start the course, or maybe some of your lecturer is new, but I think many of you are experienced, so you already know the system. So we will go through the system with the step-by-step -step procedure, how to set up the course when the semester starts. The next one is the criteria for the audit. Okay, now this one I will clarify a little bit. If Pern Salmi is here, our e-learning coordinator, she will also clarify or she will give you a, spe a specific instruction on this. Now, currently we have a one, seven, three, and two system, which we are following for the audit criteria. But KPT has introduced a new type of system, which is 40, 40, 20. Okay. That is uh, in the currently in the process of being approved by the Senate. So once the Senate approves, we will have this 40, 40, 20 system, which is similar to 1732, but there's only one thing, which is the interactive element. We will explain that to you when we do that. The next one is open educational resources. Now, at the open educational resources repository, we have a specific repository which is separate from library so we have oer which is for non index publication and the other uh, uh, fact, uh, the other one at the library is for only for index publication now what can you store in the oer repository you can store any content for example this lecture note we can store in oer repository so oer repository is giving you global publicity so suppose you have any kind of lectures on Islam, you can actually post them in the OER repository. And the OER repository is searchable everywhere. So it's visible throughout the world. The only thing with OER repository, you have to be careful that we don't use copyright material. Okay, so we cannot put copyrighted material in OER repository. That's the OER repository. The next one is MOOC or Massive Open Online Course. Now, many of the universities are offering MOOC. And as part of UMS KRA, we, each faculty institute and the uh, PUSAT has to offer about three MOCs, approximately three MOCs. So we are helping you to develop the MOCs. So if you decide to offer an MOC, I will uh, give you the forms. You can apply to uh, develop the MOC and we will be having a studio in installed in UMS shortly for recording the MOC uh, courses. So this MOCs are based, small courses. Now, our normal course is 14 weeks and usually three credit hours. MOC can be only four or five weeks of instruction. It's four or five lectures and you have about one credit hour. So the MOOC can be taken by the student and then combined together to create one credit, one credit course. For example, you have three MOOCs, you make one credit course. So this makes it easier for the student to understand and to do uh, the course at their own pace. So that is the MOC. Okay, let's look at the basic uh, components of what we do in the smart UMS V3. Okay, I will open up the these um, system later and I will teach you the features one by one. But now I look at the smart V3, what we need to do when the semester starts. Okay, the first one which we need to do is store your old course. This will save you a lot of time. Please do not construct the course from the beginning. So you load each lecture, each course synopsis. You don't have to do that. You can just back up the older course. <coughs> the second thing which you need to do is register the student. So I will guide you through the process of registration. There are two types of registration. One is the automated registration and one where you can give them a registration with a password. Then you can assign students to groups because you may have different groups for teaching and reflection because generally in studies involving uh, religious subjects, students will have reflection and the reflection is done in groups. So this is enable you to assign students to groups. Then we have the course synopsis. This is standard, what we call table 4.2, but in the system we call it course synopsis. The course content itself and the assignments. Okay, so I will go through them one by one. So we make a complete a set of these. 
components. Okay, then I will show you the quiz grading uh, some links to content from OER. For example, you don't have to uh, store your lecture note in the smart V3 system. You can store it in OER and just insert the link into your smart V3. So it saves you a lot of trouble because you can always access the OER and you don't have to keep on uploading your content. You can communicate with your student via chat using again uh, you again using the chat feature we can we have something known as moodle mobile plus okay now usually what happens we use whatsapp to communicate with the student whatsapp or telegram but because whatsapp has so many groups it's very hard to keep track there is a application called moodle mobile so you can go and you can download on, either on iphone or android it's called moodle mobile you just uh, search and you can install now whatever you do in moodle you can do with Moodle Mobile, means whatever you do on Smart V3, because our system, Smart V3 is based on Moodle. And then you have forum and discussion. So these are the things which we learn in the system itself. Okay, so we are going to learn about Smart V3. Uh, we will learn about the OER, and we learn about the MOOC. So that's what we will cover today. So I'm going to share my screen with you, the next screen, which is the Smart Okay, so, and I will require help from Nora. Nora, can you please share the link in the chat window? Because I, if I open the chat window, my computer will hang. Okay, doctor. Okay, so I'm in the Pusat, but we are using different terminal because I'm sick and I don't want to infect everybody else. I'm in different rooms, so I have to tell them to do certain things. So sorry about that. Okay, so now we are going to learn how to set up the course by actually registering ourselves. So in this course, Nora is going to share the link. You click on the link and register for this course. And I will show you all the features of the course, including the analytics feature of the system. Okay, so Nora will share the link in the course, in the chat window. Click on the link, Daftar for this course, and I will show you the rest. Because this course will be given to you later, uh, this uh, template, so you can use it for your future reference. Okay, so I'll wait for everyone to register and then I look for the course. Okay, some everyone registering. Okay. So I can see here. You can see my screen, right? Nora Bole number ka screen, Saya. Ken Ken, right? Okay. Swara Jalas? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, so now you can see the registration process going on. So everyone is registering. This is the first problem which uh, student, first year student will face when they enter. They will say we cannot register for the course or we have a problem with password. There's some more based on our help desk because Nora and Zula are uh, looking after help desk. Major problem is the registration part. So we can see where you register. So I refresh. Okay. okay. Dr. Habiba also registered. Now, I, I, I am registering for you for the this particular course as student because I want to show you certain feature which enable you to understand the learning behavior of the student. This is called the analytics feature. So, just, uh, I just refresh the screen up. So, I register. Okay. I'm refreshing and checking for registrations. So this is the first thing which you need to do when you 
commence your semester and you have your student register for the respective course. Sometimes students may have difficulty uh, registering. So in that case, usually they will contact the Pusat and Nora will guide them through the process. Okay, so this is the process. So while waiting for you to register, we will go back, go to the next feature which we have in the system. So now we have um, three registered users and so I will go through the features in the system for registration. Okay, now. Now, what happens in our system, right? Is because sometimes students uh, will register for the wrong course. They may register into the wrong course and then they will be in that course. And then they, when they deregister, it becomes problem for the lecturer because you have the uh, record for the teaching file. The file courses will be having a lot of data, which is not supposed to be there. So to prevent that, usually one of the things which you can do is you can go this site, you go through the this side window here, you go to users. See, I'm just going to click. So users. So there is an icon here called users, which will come in your window in your in your uh, PP. Oh, sorry, in your smart V3 tab. So you can click here. Users. And you can click here on enrollment method. Now, this is an enrollment method. There are different kinds of enrollment method. For example, now uh, you all are doing self enrollment. Self enrollment means I share the link. You can share via email, student email or WhatsApp, and they will click and they will enroll. That's what we have done now. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so this is the first kind of enrollment, but you can also use the <laughs> enrollment method which allows here yeah. choose you then show you the next enrollment method <coughs> this is called self enrollment method okay. so what is the self enrollment for this one you need to generate a password so you go to user and you select self enrollment now when you decide to do a self enrollment you have to always give a instance name custom instance name this is actually the course code okay so this is the course code i i'm just going to type course code so i just type one two three four because we are just using default course but when you have a course you give the course code there. you allow existing enrollment now suppose you have already started the process of enrollment you need to keep this on yes because if you don't put it on yes the older students will automatically get unenrolled. So you need to leave it as yes. So I would suggest that at the beginning of the semester to prevent confusion, students from, uh, uh, for example, the core course, elective course, to prevent this, you start this process at the beginning of the, the before the first week, when you, before you launch your course, you start this process. So you do a self-enrollment, the instance name, you change, you don't change any of these, you only add here. Click to add text and give it a password. Okay. Now I'm going to give it a password A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. This is the password. You can give your password base. Let's show you the password. Okay. So this is A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now in the morning, three of our colleagues registered for the course, but if you want, um, if everyone who registers after this, we'll have to use the password because I've already said the A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Okay, so the default role is student. And so oh, I just saw this. You can block the date of enrollment if you enable this. So that means you only allow enrollment for a certain time and then you close. This is to prevent students from enrolling in the middle of the course and then they will not be able to follow the changes in the course. Now, be careful with one thing with the student. You must always tell them not to unenroll from the course once they enroll. Because if they unenroll from that course, all their data will be lost. All the data related to their assignments, their grading, their quiz, everything related to a student will be lost if they unenroll. When they re enroll, the data will be gone. That's why you inform the student not to unenroll from the course. There is a feature in the system to prevent them from unenrolling. We don't enable it. It's deep in the system, but just tell them not to unenroll or they will lose their content. 
usually that's it. So um, this one you don't change. You can enable this if you want to. For example, you only want enrollment in the first week of the course. You can enable this. If not, leave it by default. And then you have the custom welcome message. So then you can start your welcome with welcome to the course and your welcome remark. So some of the uh, lecturers, some of the lecturers in this part, they will put a YouTube video telling about the course. They will say, welcome to the course on certain subject. In this course, you will be learning about this. You are expected your learning outcomes are this and so on and so forth. So you just say, okay, so I just system a bit slow. That's so one minute. Add method. So once you have done everything, you we click on add method. Now the method is added. Now let's see the users who are in the course. It will be this course people. Okay, so we have our enrolled users here. Okay, so we have our enrolled users. So we have one, two, three, four. So now we have everyone enrolled for this course. If everyone, if, if somebody wants to enroll after this, they have, they will have to use that password ABCD one, two, three, four. Okay. So that's the uh, lock the enrollment for this course. So this is the 1st thing which you can do for this. Uh, process of registration. Okay. Now, once you have registered the uh, students. You have the choice of assigning them into groups. So, usually lecturers will um, have. Different options of assigning group. They want to assign group sometimes only for um, certain part of the course. For example, assignment will have group and the regular course, they'll have individual assignment. So you can do it. So any way you want. So in users, <coughs> I will show you the group feature, but once we get more user. Take your time, doctor. <laughs> Take yeah, your sorry, time. sorry, I got cough because okay. of this. Okay. Yeah, take your sorry. time. <laughs> Econ blowing. Econ is the hottest, so. It's a joke. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke, that's why I cough. Okay, so this is the feature which you need to use. I will show you the group feature. Wait one minute after I go into the course again. <laughs> Because we have few, sorry, because we have few user, it's hard to make group. Okay, so we just have to wait for maybe more people to log in. Uh, maybe not. Nora and Zul, you can register for the course. I need to make group. Otherwise, I cannot make group because there's only few of us. The system bit slow today, so I have to. When the system is slow, right? Uh, I'm accessing the smart and then I'm also using WebEx, so it will be a bit slow. Okay, so this is the first thing which you need to do is to uh, make the group. The next thing which you can do, okay, this is what I recommend to all the lecturers is to back up and restore the course. So what you can do is you need to go to an existing course. For example, you are teaching a course code for last semester and you want to repeat it in this semester. You go to that course and you actually have a button here called backup button here. Now, in this course, which we are teaching today, we don't have content because I have not uploaded content in this course. But if you are teaching on the course, you will definitely have content. Okay. So now what happens is that you have backup setting. We have backup setting and usually in this backup setting. We can select what we want to backup. Backup means what we are creating a file of the entire course. This is actually our course file. Or we can actually attach it to our file for the our MQA document. So usually for the course file, if you want to make, you have to use include enrolled users. So if you don't want to include all the enrolled users, you just want to backup the information, you just click here. Click on that, it will go out. So that means for example, I'm teaching the course in semester one. I want to transfer the lecture note 
assignment, quiz, everything to semester two. But I don't want to transfer the users, otherwise the users will register for the next course. So I just click on this button. Okay. After you finish this, you can go down. Okay. And we go next. So it keeps, uh, it lasts you for, um, one minute, it's hanging again. Yeah, so you go next, next. Yeah. Yeah, so you will see it, it's, Taking time because it go, I click next, huh? so next. Okay, so it shows you all the content which is there. So you have um, the, all the course content here. Okay, and then you click next. Now, backup and restore sometimes on your system may uh, require like multiple try because uh, the backup is easy, but restore sometimes takes time because the restoration is done using UMS server. Okay, I click here next. So what will happen is once the back, once you create this backup file, it's asking you the last setting will be here backup setting, and then you create it will say create backup file. It keep asking you because it wants to confirm. Whether you really need that data or not. So whatever is tick mark green is yes, and user data is red, which means it won't capture user data. So in the last stage, the last window, there's a button here which says perform backup. You can try it out for all your courses. In fact, we recommend that all the lecturers after the uh, week 14 or the 15th week, just when your course is completed, you back up everything. You back up everything. You, it will back up in the in the UMS server. But I would also suggest you keep a backup in your computer. Now, what is this backup file? It, is it a is it a zip file or a or a text file? No, it is a specific file, which is a Moodle file. It's only recognized by the system. So whenever you want to restore your course, you can actually just upload that file into Moodle. It will restore as a full course. Okay, so that's the advantage of the backup. Now I click here, back perform backup. So it will perform the backup now because our course is new. We don't have much content. It will just create a simple file. But if your course is big, if you have a lot of content, videos, uh, lectures, it will create. It will require a lot of space. Okay. Now here it is. Okay. Now you can see here backup Moodle two course to twenty eight zero six e learning roadshow FIS. Okay, and the date is here, 940. So I have backup many of the courses from other programs because I'm showing lecturers how to backup and restore the file. Now, once the backup file is here, you can download it here by click on the download icon, which means you'll download the file, store it in your computer. I would suggest that because of the number of viruses and the uh, lot of malware attack on the PC and the laptop, you download it and you store it in the Google Drive, UMS Google Drive, because that it's safe over there. At least there, there is no uh, virus. There's a lot, lot of antivirus protection there. The other one is the restore button. Now, <coughs> suppose you want to restore, means put the file back up in your other course. You just click here, restore. <coughs> okay. Now, when you restore it, it will ask you for a destination. Destination is your new course. I'm not going to do that now because we don't have a course to which to restore the file, but usually you can do it by looking for your destination file. Okay, I just show you the first step. Okay, so. so I just have to scroll to the bottom. It's a bit slow because of the server.
so you have to do everything here okay and one minute once you finish once you have selected all you just play continue it will tell whatever needs to be restored so you have then you have to select a category this is where you have to type in your course so this is where you search and you type your course code but you must type in the specific case for example if the course code is in uh, uh huruf pesar or uh, in the um, uh, sorry upper case you need to type that here okay so be careful with that course others it will restore to the wrong course <laughs> so this, if you need help with this you can ask us and we'll guide you through it we also have put up the instruction in the 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 guide for the learning management system which you can find from our website <laughs> okay so that's so that's the process of backup and restore. So usually this is recommended because it enables you to do it, reduces your workload a lot. <coughs> so I will go back to our course. And we will see who has registered. Okay, we have. Okay, so we only have four users, so one, two, three, I want to, including me. I will ask uh, Zul and Nora to register. Zul and Nora, can you please register for the course? Because I have to make group, grouping. Otherwise, the uh, system, only with three people, I cannot group. So Zul and Nora will also register, then only I can show you the group feature. Okay, so let's go to the system when they are registering. I will. Uh, we will go through the next one, which is the course synopsis. So the first thing which you need to do in the system, you turn your editing on, which you are all familiar with. Editing on and the button becomes red. Now, the first thing which we try and do, right, is to meet the criteria for the 1732. But in the blended learning, the purpose of the blended learning is to enable the student to have better learning experience. Especially now, when it's pandemic time, the student is confused, especially the first year student. They will come and they don't know what's university. They have come from school, uh, school system to university system, which is different. So they also are, are having a problem to orient to the class. Lecture also has problem to how to bring them in on board. So this is a challenge for when they come, when they are doing the first week of orientation in the online environment. So this is why in the first week, it's very important to give them a lot of instruction with a video. Use your video instruction. Don't use too much text because they will be uh, confused and they will be uh, like a shock. They'll get culture shock, different learning culture. So we use more instruction. Usually if I do my course in the first week, I will put a video before. I will just tell him, oh, I'm Kenneth. I have done this. Uh, I am from, uh, this is my background. This is where I work before. Just tell him informally. And then you tell him about the course. This is your course. This is what you expected to learn. This is an informal introduction. Usually we add that video in the first week. Okay. Now, which platform should you use for video? You can use YouTube <coughs> or you can use Microsoft Stream. You have, have you know about Microsoft Stream? Dr. Abiba? <laughs> no, Prof. Never use. Mm. Okay. In the soft screen. Yeah. In uh, usually we are you using YouTube for your students? Yeah, I usually use YouTube and uh, screencast before. Oh, okay. Screencasting. Yeah. Okay. So in uh, YouTube. The problem is pub it's publicly visible. Everyone can see the lecture. Some yeah, lecture, yeah. yeah, even though it's set for private and all that, sometimes uh, lecturers, sometimes a student can download using the apps and all that. So usually there is something known as Microsoft Stream. Okay, now what has happened to us, right? When we when we uh, use, earlier we were using Google Meet, now we have the um, Microsoft Teams, WebEx. So in the Microsoft uh, Office 365 system, you can log in and you can uh, find Microsoft Stream. One minute, I, I will, I, because I'm using a terminal here, uh, I will ask Nora to project the screen. Nora, can you, Nora, you're there online, right? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, Nora, what do you do, right? Can you just show uh, uh, Microsoft Stream? You just show Microsoft Stream because if I open Microsoft Stream window on my system, it may crash again. Can you open up Microsoft Stream? I will try, but the system is very slow. Stream. Okay, no, I'm trying, huh? Sai Chuba. Okay, this is Microsoft Stream, if you can see. Microsoft Stream is a video streaming service. Okay, now this UMS account is also used by the KP, it's provided by KPT for all of us in the in the public university system. And with Microsoft Stream, you get privacy. So everyone cannot see, it's not for public use. Only UMS registered user can see your stream. Now, how do you register for stream? You don't have to do anything. You just log in with your same user ID and password as your Office 365 account. So you go here and you sign in. One minute, I just move this window down. You sign in using your UMS Office 365 account. Okay, so you have your stream account here. Yeah. Okay, and I'm uh, okay. So you have your content here. So now I'm logged in as Kenneth, <coughs> and I have content here. Now, and I have my video here, right? Only my student can access somebody else's video from UMS and so on and so forth. This is not my video, but once you have content here. You only can um, allow UMS user to view it. Nobody else can view it unless they are logged in with the UMS user ID and password. So this keeps control on your content. Otherwise, you will find uh, people copying your content and so on and so forth from YouTube. And you, many lecturers may not like that. So in Microsoft Stream, you can create a live event. I wouldn't suggest to do this because the speed, but you can upload uh, videos here and you can also watch other content here. Usually in your content, you will see videos. See my content. Yes. Slowly. If you, for my teaching, I usually use YouTube because my content, uh, I don't mind if other people reuse it. It's, it's uh, free to reuse. But some lecturers may be um, sensitive to their content being reused. So, uh, for that, I would suggest to use this stream channel. So, slow. As with all Microsoft platform online, this we will find slow. But this is the platform to use. And in this one, you can create the video. If you need training on the Microsoft Stream, I'll have to do it separately uh, for you. Okay, I think I will. I should organize a training on Stream. Usually it's under JTMK, but we will do it. We can do a training for you for stream on the BP okay? because I need to guide you through the entire process of uploading. You can upload your screencast o matic video in the stream as well. Just add, create it here and you upload the content. So the create button is here and then you can upload your video. So once you upload your video, your content will be on stream. Now, if you are having a screencast o matic license, which we had purchased last time, and you will know that the license already expired, you can actually record screen or video here. Okay, there's a screen or recorder video on the Microsoft Stream. I wouldn't, I would recommend that when you are doing your lecture online, like now I'm doing now, I won't record the screen because the system resource will be too much and the system will crash. <coughs> so I'll go back to my smart learning management system. Okay, we go back to this. So, as I mentioned earlier, the first week should be generally uh, video based lecture and um, more and less of text. Now, what is the first activity we add in your system? The first activity we add is here, which is your course synopsis. Yeah, I will not add course synopsis now because of, but I will show you the button for that so you can add. And I have seen all your courses online, which in your system. They all have the course synopsis, so the lecturers know this button here. So this is the course synopsis button. You add course synopsis, and this will only be a in the form of a PDF file. Okay, so 
you you type the usual here. You type course synopsis. Uh, then you have the description. For the description part, you can copy the introduction of your table 4.2 with the learning outcomes, CLO and the PLOs. Yeah. Okay, so you have your description here. You can drag and drop the PDF file here into the system. I'm not going to do it now because the system is slow. You can drag and drop the file here and then you have this one here. Now for this activity completion, you need to click on this. Show activity as complete when conditions are met. Yeah, by I would again, this is another thing based on the experience with the system based on input feedback from other lecturer. You can only track the students activity when you have this button set as. Show activity as complete when conditions are met. If you don't select this button. It's very difficult to track the progress of the student. Okay, because the system, this learning management system is actually intelligent. You can actually track. The students performance in the system means are they watching the lectures? Are they um, uh, viewing the slide? You can get all that information out using analytics. Dr. Abiba, are you using analytics feature in the system? No, <laughs> no not using, right? Actually, this is a very important feature because you can find out which student is lagging behind in class. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will show you the feature. So we have to choose this mode of completion tracking, doctor. For all, all, for all, Dr. Abiba, please use the activity completion because if you don't do that, the system will not track. Okay, okay, okay. The module system is designed is to give both the user, uh, both the lecturer and the student the freedom of choice. Like when you visit any website, they will say cookies, accept all cookie. So usually we say yes or no. So this is the same feature. <laughs> okay, okay, no. okay, sorry. Okay, so this is our system. Sorry, uh, system. Sorry, hang. Okay, so this is how it's done. Okay, now once you have the the course synopsis in place, this is another feature which is very important in, especially if you are teaching uh, many courses and you have many students. This is called a tags feature. What this does is it attaches as hashtag. For example, course uh, synopsis. If I type the word course synopsis. One, two, three, four, the course code. And then I click enter. Now, this will actually give the, uh, the course synopsis one tag, a hashtag. What happens with that hashtag is that if you are using the uh, smart V3 and you've logged in as a lecturer, you can find this course synopsis just by searching for the hashtag. So hashtagging the all the content is very good. You can hashtag lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, lecture four, so that your student as well as you can actually find that particular tag. Once you finish all this, you save and return to the course and usually save and display. Now I have not uploaded the file because if I upload the PDF file, the system will get hang again. I'm on a slow system, so we'll see that. Uh, okay, so I will ask Nora to upload and add the PDF file. Nora, can you please help me to add PDF file in this in that block because I, my system is slow. Just add, a, yeah, just add a random PDF file, a, a usually blank page, so it's easier to because it's, my system is slow. So just complete this while I go back to the course. Uh, doctor, uh, one question. Yeah. Um, if you want to make our uh, folder in Smart Version 3M as private, uh, can we remove the student that already registered in our course? Or, uh, is it okay or is it an ethical or? <laughs> to uh, means you want after you finish your course. Yeah. After. Then, you okay. Yeah. So you want to make it private after you finish? Yeah. You can do that actually. You just unenroll everyone after you finish the course. But before you unenroll, make sure that your course file has been created. Okay. If you unenroll, you won't get the original data back again. Oh, okay, okay. 
because based on our system, right? Even uh, alumni can view our older courses. Yeah. yeah so sure. if we could private, you just unenroll. Just unenroll. Unenroll everyone from mid course. They cannot view if they are unenrolled. They cannot view the content anymore. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> because sometimes uh, this is from some faculty. The issue is student from first year enroll for second year course. They will yeah, yeah. Lecture yeah, notes uh, from uh, first semester. They still enroll in the current semester. Then it yeah, and <laughs> you lost your cognitive that. They, are, they already reached C5 or C6 already because they already got the course for content before. Yeah, they said, hey, doctor, SM content, eh, sama lah, macam semester lepas. <laughs> yeah, that's why. So, doctor, that's why I suggest to you, don't allow them to, uh, you give them the uh, enrollment with passcode. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So, you only share, so, okay, like this. So, what you do, you make the uh, Moodle Mobile, the F1, and then you ask them to all install Moodle Mobile. Mm. Even Puan Salmi is there, our course coordinator, she also recommend the same thing. They all have Moodle Mobile, they will all enroll. They will receive the, the course, the code only to that. Oh, okay. And then you check because you have to monitor sometimes, right? Uh, some lecturer, they will complain to me. They say, suddenly some new students registered in my course. From where? Yeah. I, yeah. They are from other courses, not even from your faculty sometimes. <clears throat> same yes. problem here, doctor. <laughs> Oh yeah, right. So then that's why you give the code, doctor. It's it's so you're facing the same problem. Mm -mm. Usually majority of the people who complain about this are from plumes. Because plumes, uh -huh. uh, the uh, students, sometimes they want to take the lecture note for themselves. <laughs> you know, from other universities and so on and so forth. So the best way to do it is by using code, uh, the code. And there is no way to prevent people from taking lecture because student can download and Share it yeah. again. Okay, so that's the first thing. So Nora will help me to upload that because I'm using terminal outside. Uh, um, sorry, uh, terminal on Wi-Fi, so it's a bit slow. So she will help to upload the PDF. <coughs> the next one is you need to decide whether you want to teach by the date or you want to teach by the topic. Usually, because our Takwim academic is already set. We prefer to teach by the date, so students are not confused. By, but some of the lecturers who teach by the CLO, they may want to teach by the uh, topic, especially for those who are postgraduate or for the senior senior student, they will prefer to teach by topic. But this is entirely the choice of the lecturers themselves. Okay, now doctor was asking regarding the content, uh, the lecture, how to. Because the, the thing about lecture note is that the lecture note is something which you have spent a lot of time creating, but it's not acknowledged as publication. It is considered as a, uh, a just a lecture note, but it's actually a creative content. So how do we uh, ensure that that creative content is attributed to you? You are the author is by using the UMS OER system. I will cover the OER system later, but usually what happens in the OER system, we can generate a link to the lecture note. <coughs> and then we can add the link here. So I'll show it here. <coughs> Doctor, do you add the lecture note directly in the in the content as PDF file? Or do you yes, but in PowerPoint. <laughs> PowerPoint. In PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will show you the simpler way to do it to protect your, your content. Yeah. What you do is you do not use uh, first. You uh, first thing, do not upload any PowerPoint in the Smart Tree. Okay, don't upload because first of all the memory will be uh, it uses up more memory space. Secondly, when you have PowerPoint, the student can immediately download, re-edit, and reuse. So what we do generally is we recommend to the lecturer to use PDF. Convert all your lecture note to PDF, and then we store it here. One minute, I go to one. Yeah, I just log out from this and I log into OER. OER.ums.edu.my. Okay. Are you familiar with the OER system, doctor? Your staff? No. <laughs> okay. So this is the UMS OER system. Now, 
this ums oer system is we are trying to promote as a one stop center for everything for you so you will have your lecture note everything over here so you have, if you have not registered here i will just go briefly into this because i need to show you how to use the system for lecture note which is part of the smart p3 okay what is this oer system whatever lecture notes i create in ums for many many whenever as long as i was in ums i create lecture note I upload here in this OER system. All the lecture notes are stored in the OER system. What is the advantage of the OER system? You don't have to use any more PowerPoint uh, upload in your smart anymore. You just upload the link. So the memory is saved. The second thing, this is actually a non-index publication. So you can actually get credit in your ELNPT as non-index publication. Okay, that's the other advantage. The third advantage is everybody in the world can see your lecture note. But in order to do the OER resources uh, content to use this, your lecture note should not have any copyrighted material. Any kind of calligraphy, any kind of a picture should be original or from other sources, but not copyrighted material. Okay, so this is the OER system. <coughs> now, how do you use the OER system? Doctor, you have an account here. Not yet, bro. <laughs> okay, what do you need to do, right? You, you need to click on this button here, register. Click on the register button. I would suggest to all your lecturers who are watching to please click on the registration button because during the roadshow, we will help you to do the registration process immediately. You click on registration. Can you see the, uh, the new user registration here? <laughs> Can see doctor here. Still learning, bro. OER.ums.edu.my. Okay, you, uh, Nora, so, uh, Nora shared in the link. So we register using our uh, UMS, UMS email. UMS, yeah, yeah, UMS mail. Because the system will only uh, detect your UMS mail. This is only for UMS user. Okay, and I receive a, a notification to verify my email, right? Doctor? Yeah, yeah. So this is why we do it during roadshow because uh, Nora is in charge of the system. She will um, automatically enroll you because this is and then second uh, rule when you log in, don't use your UMS HR online password. Use other create new password. Don't use the similar password. That's what we oh. for security. Use a new password. A new password. Yeah, different, different. Different from EMS mail password. Yeah, don't it. use don't use the same one because the system is different from our HR online. Uh, our first name and our last name, uh, still same with uh, our... everything is same. Everything oh. is same except the password. You change it. So you will register and then your system will be active for you. And our contact telephone, our our private number or our <laughs> UMS. You can use the same UMS. Okay. It's asking you are registering now. Yeah. Okay. Let everyone also whoever is here can register. Okay. And I have complete my registration. Uh, and you are now registered to use the OER UMS system. Uh -huh. Okay, good, good. So now I'll guide you to the process and how you how you can uh, ensure all your lecture notes are uh, protected. And so now I'm already here, so I'm going to log in. Oh, okay. So I'm going to log in here, and then if you follow my steps, you will say. So I will log in here with my name, with UMS name. And we have password. I'm using a current password. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my 
the system, right? Uh, my system here, the keyboard is hang, keyboard is leg. <laughs> Board is lagging, so when we are on WebEx, this is what happens. The okay. Wait for the system to I'm Rita. I just refreshed the screen. I have to refresh my screen. Now, one second. Huh? Your time, doctor. Yeah, yeah. it's it's okay. the system. Uh, yeah, moment I moment I uh, use Webex, the system is actually slowing down. Yeah, yeah. Very slow. also slow down. Even here, we are in the FKI. Still here, the internet slow. How many students do you have, doctor, for your uh, respective courses, approximately? Uh, for this semester, current semester, I have approximately uh, 200 and... 200? Because oh. uh, uh, I'm, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm still teach uh, PPIB course, courses oh, with Dr. Okay. Shamsul and Dr. Hidayat. So, courses Saudi University, doctor. And for one section, we have uh, approximately 110 students. Oh, okay. That's a lot of students. Yeah. Yeah. This for the faculty Islam, how many students they intake? Faculty Islam, uh, for one course, uh, approximately uh, within uh, 30 until 60 students for one course. What about the, do they complain about the connectivity issue with the online system? Connection, any uh, problem? I'm not so sure. Uh, Dr. Hidayat, <laughs> can Dr. Hidayat uh, and Dr. Shamsa? Uh, Sometimes, uh, Dr. Kenneth. Sometimes. Oh, sometimes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That, that this is the problem with the teaching with more and more because the number of student increase on the WebEx the connectivity issue comes. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, we will go to the repository. Okay, load it finally. So this is the UMS repository. Now I'm logged in. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. So, once we are logged in, right? Uh, how the system is stored here is that the data is not stored in faculty, it's actually stored in something known as community. So we are all a community. For example, 
uh, my faculty is biotech, so I am community in biotech. But now I'm using the admin terminal, so it's showing you the different communities. So here, yeah, faculty of Islamic studies is here, and you can see the content at the side of this. The number of contents in each faculty here. Okay, let's see how we uh, how we actually use the system. For example, if you want to deposit a new content, okay, a lecture note, first step, convert the content to PDF file. Make sure that it's not copyrighted. So you convert it into PDF format, store it in your system. The next thing what you do is you click on your respective faculty. Now I cannot click on your faculty or your institute because I'm not a member of your faculty. You will only be able to click on your respective faculty. Okay, now suppose I am from Pusati Pembajaran, I can click here. I'm using the admin terminal so I can see all the faculties. In your terminal, it may look slightly different because it's um, uh, for the respective faculty. We can only deposit in our faculty to which we are registered. For you, for example, if you are from two faculty, PPIB and Faculty Islam, you can only deposit in the faculty to which you have been designated. If you have a problem or issue with that, I mean, if you want to adjust, you can ask Nora regarding how to adjust to your respective block. Okay, so she can assign you to that so that you can deposit in more than one block. Okay, now what's inside this OER repository? You have e article, you can put ebook, e note, educational videos, infographic, and experiences. This is like a kind of a kind of a community collection. Usually we uh, deposit e-notes or e-articles. E-note refers to the lecture note. So your PDF, you can deposit under e-note. So once you have your e-note, you can link back to the original lecture. I will show you how it's done. So for example, if I go to e-note, I click on e-note. Okay. And inside this, I have MOOC lecture note here. I click here. So now I want to use this MOOC lecture note for many lectures. I don't want to use it only for one place. I want to use it in multiple places. So what I do here, I have to click on the URL. <coughs> copy the URL. Copy link address, copy the URL, and then you come here to my course, my smart system. Now, now I'm in my smart learning management system here. Now I want to add my lecture note here, <clears throat> but I don't want to upload the PDF. I don't want to upload the PowerPoint, etc. So what I do, I add an activity or resource here. So add an activity or resource, and then I have. URL here, yeah, URL is here. Click on URL, add the URL. Okay, so now what comes here is the link to the window for the URL link. So the name of the URL will be Name of this URL will be, for example, this is lecture one. And then you copy and paste the URL. You have copied the URL. You just click here and you paste here. And you just give a description. This description is required so the student will understand what. So in this one can be your introduction. So you just put your introduction slide, you copy and paste the content here so the student knows what is expected of them to be learned in that lecture, uh, expected outcome. And then this one, right? For this one, by default, it should be display description on course page. The reason why we need to do that is because if the student is using desktop 
to laptop they will see all the content in one loading session okay why is this important for student okay now suppose we are in the university we have unlimited connection so we are using the unlimited broadband but in the kampung they may not have unlimited connection every time they click and refresh the screen they are using data so it refresh but when you click when you have this display description on the course page you click here what happens is that all the content gets loaded in one time at one time they can see all the links okay now this is very important because during the pandemic time during pkp emc we are you are you are getting actually the 1 gb free but now that 1 gb free per day it has been stopped the feature so if the students cannot access so those students who cannot afford this feature uh, the internet they will have difficulty when it comes down to downloading so that is why we suggest you put this display description on course page the other advantage of using link is that the student again will save data if they if you give them powerpoint or pdf they will have to keep on uh, viewing that and again data loss so this is what we uh, do on activity completion you can track activity students must view this activity in order to complete it and then students can so must complete the activity and conditions are met so students act show activity as complete when conditions are met which means the student has to click on the link then only they are will be tracked as completion completed now suppose you want the student to uh, view it within certain date you can actually click here enable it so you have given the lecture for example today you want the student to download the lecture note today you can click enable but you have to be careful with this link because most of my student they will not download if i put that they will share <coughs> they will share the lecture they will take from their friend copy on the pen drive and they will share it or, and then you cannot track so this is what we set for that and usually for tag we set the lecture one just click here and i put lecture 1 and then your course code usually you put lecture 1 and course code so you get a tag hashtag and save and display uh doctor uh we don't have to put uh the hashtag symbols just type uh, the course code yeah, in the yeah, name of yeah, yeah yeah doctor the, the system will generate for you the hashtag Oh, okay. Something like YouTube account where we don't type in hashtag, right? We just put in that code. Now, what happens is that you can, when you go back to your home, and mm -hmm. you, you can actually find your hashtag. For example, your student want to find a lecture note for your course code. They can actually put lecture one hashtag, or lecture two hashtag, that course code. They will find it will search the system will find. But sure. it's case sensitive, so if you can look for caps, it's, it's oh, not. Okay. <laughs> it's not intelligent now what you can see here is the lecture one and uh, when the student clicks they can access directly to the oer so i'll show you i turn editing off for a while and i will show you how it works so lecture one is here now nora has uploaded synopsis here this is lecture one i want to move my lecture one to below so i just move later i move it okay so i click here first lecture one later i move it but my editing is okay. So directly the lecture will go to the OER repository. Now, what happens in the OER repository is that in the OER repository also the information is tracked. So you can actually find out, we can actually track how many people are viewing your lecture from the repository because they have a, a log, a log file for this as well. <laughs> okay, now here, sorry. <laughs> Here, the lecture note is here. You, the student can view it here directly, view open. No need to download again. It's here, it's ready made, re readily available for the student. So this is how you have all the content in one place at one time. This is a UMS MOOC lecture, which I want to give to you anyway. So I uh, share it with you on this screen for your resource. Now, what, what, what happens in the OER repository? This is another uh, thing which I have to inform uh, the respective lecturers before. 
Okay. Now, in the OER repository, anything content which is there can be downloaded, reused, and remixed by other lecturers. For example, if I put my lecture note there, I should be willing to share it for everybody. If I don't want to share my lecture note, I should not put it there because once it's in OER, what the what OER means, open educational resources, which means that anybody anywhere in the world can download that lecture note. They can change it slightly and they can reuse it, but they cannot make money out of it. They cannot monetize. For example, if somebody took my lecture note and they modified it and then they made money out of it, then it's actually violating the principle of the OER. It is not ethical. So OER is a good way to share content ethically, means it's an ethical way, and then it creates more and more visibility for you. So this OER system, right, is based on something known as DSpace, uh, DSpace repository. What that DSpace is, is a repository-based system, which is accessible on Google. For example, if you type uh, MOOC UMS uh, lecture note in Google, you will find this lecture note because this is deposited under UMS repository. So we were encouraging the lecturers to use this repository because we want to increase the visibility of UMS. Because at the end of the day, our ranking, our ranking based on the ranking agency is based on our university's reputation and visibility. If we use OER, we get more uh, more visibility. So when we have more visibility, people know who is UMS. That is why we encourage uh, the lecturer to help UMS by please depositing your lecture note here. Okay, but this is not compulsory. We leave it entirely up to the respective lecturer. We are not going to. I mean, I don't want to uh, make uh, say it's compulsory, but it's, it's just to help UMS to become more uh, visible. Now, how do you actually deposit your lecture note over here? Suppose I have this lecture note. Okay, just to show you, I will guide you through the process so that it becomes easier for you to use the system. So, if I have fourteen lectures, for example, I have. Um, I have all my lecture notes from, for example, I'm teaching biotech. Everything is there. So people are downloading. Some of them have been downloaded 200, 300 times. So people are obviously using. So I have here all my lecture notes here, e notes. So you can, uh, people can download. Only thing when I upload them, I make sure that there is no uh, copyright material. Okay, so every, every faculty has its own collection and their own resources which they can use. How do we deposit? We go to the next step. How do we create content and deposit here? And what kind of content can be deposited and who can do it? Now, anything which you write, for example, you write a single piece of paper, you write something, you write your thoughts, a reflection. It's a reflective note. You can deposit in the OER. If you if you go and click a good photograph, you can deposit in the OER. Make a video, you can deposit in the OER. So OER is all creative content. It can be a poem, it can be a, a script, it can be a calligraphy, it can be anything which goes in the OER. It's all creative content. So how do we deposit here? When you are in the system, you click here on this button called submissions. Okay, so if you have a lecture, you can, uh, if you have a PDF ready file, you, I can guide you through the process right now, but I will show you the whole process step by step. So these are content which I have deposited earlier. The button which you need to click here is here. It's a small link. It says start another submission. You will see it in your uh, login window. When you log in, you'll see that submission and start another submission. The buttons are not big and uh, beautiful there because this is a basic system. So the button is just like a link. Now, once you see your item submission, you will see a selector collection. Doctor, can you check your system to see whether you have been allocated a collection? Just check huh? because, some, because when you first register, sometimes the lecturers cannot find their collection. I think the other lecturers who are watching also, can you please register because Nora will help you to. No collection, doctor. <laughs> no collection. Uh, you should see I... the faculty Islam. 
faculty of Islamic studies and I can see. Uh, I click... you see like this drop down uh, box, but because I'm using admin, it will show everything, but submissions. Uh, okay. Faculty. Uh, no collection of the uh, what was stated okay. here. You may start a new submission. Uh, click you must uh, click on that uh, start new submission okay faculty oh, you can see right uh, yeah. I, i'm seeing the the terminal here it means pp yeah. so yeah. it so it shows many things faculty of islamic studies e articles e books e notes and educational videos yeah 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 that's the one so if you have your lecture note ready i can guide you to the process of how to deposit now only if you if you want to do it, so <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you have any, so even your students' uh, projects, right, uh, and uh, the um, assignments and projects can be deposited as um, content here in the repository. Yeah, I just go to Pusat E Mumbalajaran. I just click on E Nota just to show you how it do. Just click here. So I go on Pusati from Lajar and E-Note. Okay, once you select your collection, if it's a lecture note, you put as E-Note, you click on Next. This can also be the um, reflective notes and all. Then comes the author. Okay, now, if you uh, the thing about the system is that the students cannot deposit any content in the system. But to be ethical to students, again, it's a question of ethics in OER. Uh, we have to enter their names here by ourselves. So suppose the student has created a work, but you are the, also the lecturer involved. We can actually add them as author here. <coughs> so the first is your first name. Okay, your last name. Then you put your first name. Yes. Okay. If you want to add author, you can add an author by clicking here. Add and then the next names of the author will come here. So a new new block will come. So you can, mm -hmm. And then you'll add your name of your collaborator. For example, you're teaching the course with two student, two lecturers, and you have so you can add here. And the next thing which you need to add is the title of the course, the title of your content. So it'll be lecture note. For example, I just I'm just using random. So I just type lecture note one. Like, right. then you put the uh, the other items. For example, you have uh, version one or version two. You can put here, and then you can add a year. You can add a year and a date here. Okay, so you add twenty twenty two. And then publisher. Usually, for your own self published content, don't write any publisher name here. Otherwise, the publisher will, uh, UM, we cannot use UMS here because we are actually writing our self content, unless it's UMS publisher. Citation, if you need. You cannot use our name, doctor. <laughs> uh, publisher, no, 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 don't put because somebody may ask. <laughs> So we don't use the MS publisher on the So usually here, uh, <laughs> citation, if you want your work to be cited. For example, you want uh, Habiba at all, you put your name and so and so and so and so, and then you can write your title as you want in whatever format, APA or the, the Chicago, whichever format they're using, you can use here. And then you here we don't have usually all these ones we don't have ISSN number ISPN number we don't have this and we, this one usually we don't have because our article this article self generated then we have the book chapter ebook whatever so in this one it's actually uh, e article right so, See, there is also the thing for images. Images means you can even uh, do photography and upload images here, okay? but it will become open access after that. There's no more copyright. So I'm just going to put slow.
we cannot upload a thesis yeah that's one of the finally a project thesis cannot be uploaded here because that will come under the yeah, under so i will call my article as learning object because it's a, it's something which can be used for learning a language of course you can select it's called limited language here i just select english general Okay. Why is this language important is be, not because of the language which is used, it's because of the search engine. So suppose I selected English United States. Example, see English United States, right? Means the article will only be searchable in Google USA. If you select here, it will select in English. Okay, and then just next. Okay. Then we come down to the keyword. Now, these keywords are very important because the keyword will link to the Google search. This, this is so use as many keywords as possible. You can use even up to 40 keywords, but make sure that they are linked, they are all linked to your title. Or else, when somebody searches, for example, if I'm a user in America or in UK and I Google search University in Malaysia, Sabah, Pusat, Islam. So you, you, or uh, the faculty Islam or UMS Islamic studies or UMS Islamic, uh, advanced Islamic studies, you, they search for that, right? So they will search. You try and use as many keywords as possible because when you, uh, use many keywords, the search is more, uh, precise, but if you just use faculty Islam, uh, then uh, it will not search, but you need to add the university Malaysia Sabah faculty Islam, you can add other, all the other things related to the course here. So that means somebody searching for a similar course will find it over here and that attracts more international students as well to your course. And maybe from other, other countries, uh, the, uh, institutes of Islamic studies may also want to collaborate with you because of this course. Okay. So this is why we use the OER. It's a window to uh, getting more um, visibility and coverage for your respective course. So this is the subject keyword. Here you can add your abstract of the of the thing. Again, the abstract is search by Google. So use a lot of words here. Your sponsors, if your course, for example, if your uh, that lecture has been developed using a grant, for example, for FRGS or from the any of the um, uh, Islamic institutes, you can use the sponsorship here. The description of the content and the link. Okay, this link is usually only if you are using YouTube link, but if you are uploading PDF, there's no need. So once you finish all this, you click on next. So if the sponsor is compulsory, doctor. Sponsor, no, sponsor, you should be careful with, uh, doctor. Sponsor is not compulsory, but suppose your lecture, right? For example, if you are invited lecture from, uh, for example, the, uh, Institute, some institute has invited you for lecture, they have paid for the lecture, and then you have to give them the lecture note, then you have to put it there. But if it's not, there's no need to put any sponsor. Oh, if mm -hmm. FRGS grant, suppose you have received FRGS grant and your lecture is based on a FRGS uh, report, you want to upload the report here, then you have to acknowledge the KPT and the FRGS grant number. That's important. Mm -hmm. it's, it's okay. Captured by the system. So mm -hmm. once you've done everything, you upload the file here. You choose file and this system will only allow the PDF file. Okay. I'm not going to upload up because it will take time. So you, you choose here, upload your file and you give a file description. So you tell your file description and so on and so forth. And then you click on next. It moves on to the next one. Okay. So now it allows you to review the submission here. It will say all this. You can change. Suppose that this time you found that you made a mistake. You can correct, 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 correct. And then you click on next. And that's the important part. Now, one of the things about the OER uh, repository, right? This is why you have to be careful is that once you upload here, you cannot delete. We can delete it, but we have to go in the system and delete it. The lecturer cannot auto delete. So yes. we always say check the copyright. Same like to Nitin, doctor. Cannot delete. Same as. Same as. Same as same like turn it in, turn it in software to detect, yeah. regular, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, once you once you upload, you cannot uh, delete, and it's still uh, in the repository. 
yeah that is a problem which many times uh, like our student face they will upload they will screen actually it's their or they are they are actually finding their own publication from the old file and then yeah. it should percent similarity actually it's the yeah. uh, the catch like what they call the catch file it's a, a real time file so this is the one we have to be careful for uh, because according to the malaysian government and the ipts uh, perspective on oer right is because whatever content we create using public money this is the do it rakya what we call the public money which we are using to create content is actually for public distribution so it's public domain so uh, we are supposed we by right if you follow the everything means the ethics and everything we should be uh, giving all our content freely but of course in the public university we also have the commercializations uh, like certain thing like courses taught on plumes from income generation that one we cannot put in this uh, public domain because then uh, the university cannot generate income so these are things which the lecturer has to reflect upon before we deposit here so if you feel that your uh, content you want to share it's okay and because we are depositing there we, we are just here for a while in the university we deposit there and then we are gone right so at least there's some continuity in what we are doing because we are not permanent here i mean we are not here in the world permanent so at least when we pass on the content is still there somebody can use it so that's a philosophy then okay once you finish everything you click on i grant the license and then you complete once you complete it right it will become online available online searchable on google now once you have deposited here your elnpt will not reflect this particular content okay in order for it to be reflected in your elnpt you have to go to the smppi <coughs> system and deposit it as a non index publication you all have you are familiar right doctor with that system SM, the smppi the uh, uh, publication uh, section right uh, yeah 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 so okay. what need to do is go to the publications uh, system and then you can deposit this in that publication as non index non index okay and then this is what poan eugenia uh, has uh, found out poan eugenia is our oer coordinator so yeah. uh, so she has found out that the person you need to contact for the elnpt is mr id sufian is at the library those of you have missed for a long time will probably know mr id he was in ppi before Mr. Aidi Sufyan, so he is the person in charge of that. So if your content is not reflected in ELNPT, means you need to contact, contact them. Okay. Yeah, just contact Mr. Aidi. He will, uh, and you have to. But when you deposit in SMPPI, please uh, put up the link and the original article because he needs to verify. He will only go and verify the link. So you will click on the link. If it comes to UMS OER, he will say yes and done. And Mr. Idi will verify. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Idi will verify. Uh, PP our uh, article index. I don't know who verify. I think the uh, article Panjuliza, right? General yeah, article. but uh, yeah, Panjuliza. But I think somebody in the faculty has to confirm first. The Timbalan. Oh, yeah. Timbalan Timba, uh, Timbalan Dekan penyelidikan Dr. Sarip here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. So I log out of the system. So this is the OER system. So, doctor, I would recommend, right? Whichever of your staff is um, online now, please ask them to register in the system and get their registration details because Nora is here with, and then we will help you with the registration process. Because once we finish the roadshow, usually it's hard to get people to register again. It was very good when it was face to face because we used to come and we used to help you directly in the faculty to register. But now we are doing everything online, so the system is slow. There is so we go back ah, to this one bit. I just close. So I go back again. Back to smart tree. Okay. Now, I turn editing on again. Yeah, so we have a synopsis here and introduction slide here. I will just slide this content here. 
just slide it down, easier to manage. One is the system. <laughs> Sorry, I cough because I'm disturbing you all because I have a very bad flu. <laughs> So, okay, that's uh, take your time. <laughs> I take uh, antibiotics, so I'm also feeling uh, that's why I got cough. Oh, okay. But not COVID. I check. <laughs> <laughs> not COVID. I check. <laughs> yeah, because if COVID, I cannot, I have to teach from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. If you teach from home, I don't like because the, the internet DG and Cellcom even more slower than this. Oh. Yeah, from area so, so, so. so now uh, do you use any kind of chat feature with your student doctor chatting are you chatting with your student in the system uh sometimes prof when um i manage to uh, create a synchronous learning by a uh, forum or by chat mode oh okay you're using chat in the system yeah sometimes okay so if your lecture uh, or the other lecturers who are here in if i if if you already know i will i explain to the other lecturers here before that i want to actually go to the users and make show you how to make group hmm. So we have actually, um, they create here, okay, so students, student, okay. So we have sufficient people. I, I actually am trying to make groups, so it's easier, but we have few people, so, <clears throat> okay. So many people have registered already, one second, huh? Okay, so they have created student, student, student. I don't know who registered, I think Zul create on the other side. Okay, so, Back to the course. Now, for those of the other lecturers who are here, we will show you how to attach the chat window and why we should not use too many. Actually, we should not use too many chat uh, options for the students. They also will be confused. So when we chat with the other platforms, for example, we chat with um, WebEx using the chat window, we need to copy all those chat information and for our course file. But in the next phase, what's going to happen is we are going to have 40, 40, 20. And one of the uh, one of those element measures student interaction. So we have to audit student interaction. This is why I would suggest that you use chat directly in the system. So you add an activity or resource and you create a chat with group here. Add, add the chat. Actually, right, I'll explain to you, this system is quite um, uh, independent, which means that you can set it on automatic mode. For example, if you want a student to only view lecture one, when they have uh, completed the course synopsis, you can do that as well. It's, it's, uh, it's got a very interesting feature in uh, Smart. Just wait. Huh? So this, for example, we call this chat session. Okay. And then you give a description for the chat session. The most important component of the description will be the chat is only open for from so and so time to so and so time. So don't leave the chat open continuously or else you cannot monitor it. For example, this chat is open after the lecture, after this lecture. Um, Seven thirty to twelve. Okay, set a time, and then you give them a topic. So don't discuss anything irrelevant. So you give them some kind of topic. Usually, I use Discord for chatting, uh, Discord uh, server, but it's not very good with students because if you use that Discord, there's too many dis distraction. They put emoji and 
insert link and everything else and it becomes difficult to monitor to manage <coughs> so we go down okay so you set the chat session you can set the chat session time refresh We set the chat session here. This is important, the chat session, the time of the chat session you should set. So it's only open from 10.45 and we have to publish the chat time. So if you want to publish the chat time every day, for example, every after every lecture, you have a chat. So then you can set it up. If not, don't publish any chat time. Save pa past sessions. You should never delete messages because this Chat session, you will copy and paste in your in your file, in your course file. Everyone can view past sessions if you want them to review, usually know. And activity completion. If you want all the students to participate in the chat, you need to make sure that you set this as student miss show activity as complete when conditions are met, which means the students must enter the chat room and must uh, participate in the chat. Usually students will not, based on experience of teaching students online, in the online ecosystem, right, the student will not communicate much. I don't even know whether the students are there in the room or not, because the, everything is, uh, the camera is usually off, because they are trying to save their bandwidth. But in a class of 40, usually only two or three students will be active and engaged. I don't know whether it, this is, uh, psychological thing because of pandemic everyone has become afraid to talk or oh, because it is a natural uh, thing which we do when we are online it's hard to say uh, doctor yeah uh, can we download our student <laughs> names during chat sessions uh, to detect <laughs> where the students yeah yeah, yeah. Our uh, chat uh, yeah. can 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 uh, can uh, actually one, one, i will show you the the thing uh, how it so yeah. So, I have so many students, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why the analytics feature is important, doctor. The analytic feature is very important. So I, call, I just save this first because chat one. So let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's just save it as a chat session. Okay. okay, so after this session, okay, so I go back to it. Now, this is what uh, you, this is why the analytics feature is very important when you have 200 students. I will show you why. Now, suppose I'm in this, suppose I'm a teacher for this course and I'm teaching a class and I'm doing the chat and I randomly want to analyze my performance. <coughs> my student performance. <coughs> Know why the system very slow today the server even though it's no student no semester still it's slow <clears throat> okay what you need to do is go to your you have a block uh, administration block for your respective course. Now, now I am at the terminal. Terminal meaning this this is the admin block for the whole of UMS. So I am seeing different thing. But in your system, you will see a something known as report. Okay? So you'll see users, and you will see reports. Now click on the reports button. In this report button, right? If anyone said, for example, in the, uh, when if you have midterm exam or online tests, and then students say we could not see or we could not hear or, or they made, you can actually always check the logs, log file. Okay? But log file will come as a, like an Excel sheet. It's a lot of data which you can download. But what makes it very simple is this one, analytics graphs. Okay. Now, in the, for example, in today's session, if I want to find out the number of active students, for example, in each session, you can actually look at this number of active students here. You click here. The system in real time, it will calculate the data for any given time. Okay. So at eight o'clock in the morning, there was one active student here. You can see. 
Okay, so at uh, at uh, nine o'clock, there were five active student, five active user. Okay, so you can see who's the active user. At um, wait, one minute late. So at again at ten o'clock, there's only one active student. So there's only one active user. Now, what is the system actually doing? It's actually measuring the click rate. For example, I'm moving my mouse over here. It's it's uh, and then I click. When the student clicks on a mouse, it actually measures. So at nine o'clock, you can see. Who did the course? Who viewed the course? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You can see here. <laughs> okay, so this is all being created by our system user. So you can see. So this is a very good way to track student. Uh, student. One minute. I just click here out. So this is how you can track the student activity in the system at any given time. Now, why is this helpful to us? Sometimes you will suddenly notice that some of the student. They are not submitting assignment on time. Yeah, midterm mark is low. So you will you can identify it in the system itself. So this is a good way to track the student activity. Okay, I'll show you another one about uh, what Dr. Habib mentioned about the quiz. Okay, you want to find out who's uh, seeing the quiz, right? You click on here, hits distribution. The quiz or the chat. Okay, now you can see the who has uh, distributed uh, distribution of courses and you can also see the activity. Okay, so you can see the distribution here. So if you have a lot of students, right, you will see the distribution of the. And then we have content access. Now, this one will show you for each content, how many access you had. For example, say I show you for chat. And for URL. Okay, and build graph. Okay, now suppose you are teaching the lecture. Okay, so you can see lecture one, add one, uh, uh, one session, one session, st one student access, and no student access was seven. Chat was everyone did not access because of course I did not launch the chat. I did not tell you to chat. Okay, so at this time you can actually see. So if all the student access the chat, you will see this as showing uh, full access. So you can, uh, this is how Dr. Habiba, we actually track the students if they are in the chat or not. So if you have 200 students, you will this one should show 200 and this one should be zero. Okay. Is, is there any link to print out doctor or we this one, can no, print uh, direct, direct here on the three dot you take and you can download. Oh, okay. Download this is, this feature is actually, we try to promote as much as possible in UMS because this is actually what is known as the adaptive learning feature. Yeah, yeah. Uses like this based on the blended learning, uh, uh, the way the blended learning pedagogy is done. For instance, suppose you have a lecture um, a video, okay, and you have 40 students, but your video actually got only 20 views. So that means students are not accessing the, uh, the video very often. But what, what would happen in the reverse case? You have a video, 40 students, but your views is uh, maybe 1,600. Means students are watching the video again and again and again. So this tells you that the student video is actually difficult to understand because the students are watching it over and over and over again. So that means we have to modify that particular video to make it easier for the student to understand. That, this is why the analytics feature becomes uh, very useful for the uh, lecturer. But very few uh, lecturers use this feature. I am not sure whether they use it, but once we move on to the, we, we are trying to create, uh, I mean, we are trying to condition our lecturers to be ready for the next system, which is interaction. Because once the KPT starts monitoring the interaction of the system, they will ask for this data. They will say, oh, you have a 1732 is okay, but are you sure their student is interacting or not? <laughs> so then we'll have uh, to explain the data. This is where the, data comes in. So assignments as well, you can track using this system. In fact, you can track almost all the students um, uh, access in the system, whatever is in the system, you can track. It measures two things. One is the hits on that particular icon. Second one is measuring the clicks. So more students click, you will have more uh, hits and the log file will reflect this. Now, 
all this you can actually get uh, the information out in all these but this is more like uh, it's more uh, excel type format okay you get statistics and all that but i would prefer to use the reports and the hits so this one will give you uh, uh, excel format but the graphic format is better okay doctor any other any question is Very clear. Sorry. Very clear, doctor. Very clear. <laughs> any question from the other lecturers? If there is any question, I can answer related to this because this is feature we uh, want you to. We want everyone to use. Make it easier for your your. I mean, for especially if you have too many students, it's easier to use. Okay, so this is the system. Okay, now in this one, we can actually create group. Okay, so let's go to people and create groups. I think Zul and Nora have created some additional users, so we can create groups. Okay. Okay, now once we have seen all our users, right, we go to the user section, you can create group. Okay, so we have here, I think Zul has created everyone. System freeze. You know, I'm having the, the system freezing. Freezing means I click and it freeze. So, okay, the server slow. Okay, users. So in the users uh, section right here, you will see groups. So you can create group. Now, uh, one Salmi the other day, she recently she has int introduced one new widget into the system. So it en enables you to uh, plug in, to enable you to create groups by choice. Now, Doctor, I think you use this feature a lot, right? Groups. Sorry, Doctor. Do you use the group grouping feature? The, no. You don't use. A group mm -hmm. so you don't have any groups uh with 200 students is individual no, i don't have any groups oh, okay it's individual but in case any of the other lecturers want to understand the feature there's a button here which is the simplest button to create group which is called auto create groups so you click here and the system will automatically create groups based on the number of groups you want for example i want to call it a group at the group uh, group at the rate of one two three four in the number of groups I want, because we only have few people in the system, so I just make the number of groups is number of groups. And the number of groups is two. I want to divide all of us into two groups. Okay, and then the uh, allocation is random. Okay, so call it student group and parent small group, which means that if you have three groups and you have, uh, for example, 19 people, the last group will be, the last member will be put into the one of the other groups. So in our case, we won't have this, but I just, so you don't have to touch this one. If you have, for example, 201 students, then you have to here do this click, prevent last small group. Otherwise, the last student will remain by himself or herself in one group okay, and submit. <laughs> Okay, now the system has created two groups. It creates A, one, two, three, four, four people, and system B, which is one, two, two, one, three, four. So this is the other two groups which you create. Now you can add or remove users from the group. For example, if all your A students, the top students are in one group and you but you want distributed across, you can actually change the grouping based on that. Okay, so that's how you use the grouping system. This is the simplest uh, method I can teach you. There are other methods which is uh, in which you select the group. You create groups based on the just groups. Yeah. You can create group based on uh, adding or uh, deleting students from groups. So in that case, you manually add the student. But this is an automated system, so better to rely on the automated system. If you have too many students, you can't keep on uh, adjusting students here and there. So 
use automated system. So let me go back to this and I will show you how the choice system will work. So in addition to this, you can actually make groups by using a choice system. And I'm activating your resource. There is something here in uh, this is something which Pern Salmi has asked JTMK to introduce uh, to install recently because everything actually what's happening right the uh, Moodle learning management system the way it is designed is like you can imagine it's like your Android phone or your Apple phone but you can add apps to that these apps are actually called plugin or in some terminology called widget here we call it plugin what happens is that if you need a specific plugin, you can ask uh, PEP. For example, you, are, you, are, you can go to the Moodle website and you can look for plugin. And you can ask us and we will request JTMK to fix that plugin or install that plugin. Now, that plugin will enable you to do certain operations. For example, see, this is a group self selection icon here. Click here. This one allows the student to make their own group. Okay, sometimes students will not want to um, follow the lecturer's group because maybe Kawan, Kawan, all friend and whatever, they have their own internal politics. So you allow them to select democratically among themselves. So this is the group self-selection. Okay, so this will be there. So this you have to give them the rules. For example, um, make sure that the gender distribution is there in each group. For example, gender equality and things like that. You make sure the rules are here. You create a group, group, and then group name. So, okay, so you have a group name, and okay, so it's so, it's so, so you can have. Okay, now in this one, you can put your rules for the selection of the group, display description on course page, and for group selection, right? This is based on the experience of lecturers. The reason why we made it is because this is the real problem which we face now online and offline. We will, we will commence the semester, we will assign a group. And suddenly after about four or five lectures, a student will say, oh, uh, my friend is, I'm doing all the work and my other people are not doing anything. So I don't want to be in that group. You see, then the problem comes. So we say, okay, you make your own group and later on you solve. So we need to set the date for this. You enable it, for example, only on first week, 7th of March to 14th of March, open until 14th of March. So this is 14. Okay, so you tell your student between 7th of March to 14th of March, you make your group. Actually, we, because we are also trying to train them in life. We, because in reality, we have we cannot say we want to be here, be there. We have to adjust to the situation as it comes. So we say so. We create a group, and uh, you can make the maximum number of members per group, minimum number, and okay, so you have groups. And, can join group, can leave the group, and create group, but you lock it, okay? So during the process of this particular 14 days, they can join, they can leave, they can create, but they have to form a group on their own. You, you can define, you can tell them you only form three groups or four groups, okay? And then you go down, and as usual, you will have to select this when conditions are met. This one gives them the freedom to mark one second. Okay. Students can manually mark the activity as completed because this is their choice. Expect completion, enable the date, and change this to 14th March. See the 14th March. So they have 14th March to complete. Just as we set and save and display. Now, what the student will see in their system will be you can click and you can see. See, open until my create new group. Okay, so we have everything here. So you can. What is the function of restrict access, doctor? Restrict, restrict access? access. Yeah. You, you mean in the previous screen or in this uh, here? A previous. Uh, okay. Okay. Display. I, yeah, I will go. I will go through that. I will go through it one minute. I, okay, I was a little 
floppy system is here, so let's check it out. Mm. So this is the groups which are created. You can create or join a new group. So the student will become a member of so-and-so group. They can join or leave. So this gives the student the freedom to choose their own group. Later on, they cannot say, uh, we don't want to be and we want to be in this group. So up to them. Okay, this is regarding the restrict access. Now, restrict access is a feature which is not designed to restrict access from the student, means we don't exclude student from the system. It is restrict access, prevents the student from going to one, from jumping from one section to another section without completing the first section. I will show you how it's used. Okay, <coughs> now, suppose I have this, just scroll down. Now, suppose I have lecture one, okay, lecture one, and I want to edit. Okay, I'll show you how we use the restrict access button for this. Edit settings. Okay, now I, I'm in the class, but I want all the student to download my synopsis. They have to see view the synopsis before they want to go to lecture one, or they have to complete uh, lecture one before they can go to lecture two. But sometimes students will tend to one, uh, tend to uh, jump. They will go to lecture two, lecture one, and they will disrupt the learning process because that's what usually happens. So what we do in this one, we have a restriction button. Okay, lecture one, and then we come to restrict access. Okay, we click here. Restrict access. Now in the restrict access, it will ask you for a condition. Just as you say, I, uh, you cannot uh, view lecture two until you have completed lecture one. So you add restriction here. Now the restriction I want to add is as follows. Okay. Eight, for example, I want the student to only watch the lecture or view the quiz when it reaches the date, for example, the 14th of March. So I can set the date. Okay. I can set the grade, for example, they can only go to lecture three when the quiz is more than 80 marks. I can set the grade for that and so on and so forth. This is restriction set, which is more complex. You can add more, but usually most lecturers will add by date or by grade. So they can only go to lecture three when they achieve 80% in the quiz. But this is the one which we are talking about now, activity completion. Student can only uh, choose Choose one second. Uh, okay, so synopsis. Okay. I choose synopsis must be marked as complete. This is why we have to add must be marked as complete. Okay, so now this is activity completion means. In order for the student to view lecture one, they must view the activity synopsis and mark as complete. So I save and display. Now something will change in the system. Yeah. Now if you view your terminal, right? Because I'm doing the lecturer's terminal, you will see something. Can you see restricted doctor there? Top viewer, you will see us. Your, can you see on your uh, screen restricted? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so this means that lecture one is restricted. So you actually have to view synopsis. So you click on synopsis. <coughs> Once you click on synopsis, the restriction will be removed. So this is to prevent from uh, jumping across the lecture note. But it's not hidden, bro. It's not hidden. It's not hidden, right? It's not hidden because already you have uh, logged in earlier. But oh, okay. set it up before the course, uh, before you give it to the students, the whole course. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Clear. <laughs> yeah, so is it clear? Very clear. Yeah, very clear. Yeah. yeah, so this feature is actually used uh, when 
you you can actually automate the course you know automation meaning you put uh, lecture 1 quiz 1 lecture 2 quiz 2 lecture three, quiz 3 and four quiz for example so they have to view lecture 1 they have to score 80% in the quiz 1 then only they mm -hmm. to lecture 2 and so on and so forth you can actually set it in a automated system so it cascade it has no limit even the full 14 lecture you can automate okay so mm -hmm. for example only when they come to your class in the yeah. <laughs> they can see but they have to click on that link because sometimes what student will do they will click on the link here they will extract the webex link and they will pass to a student on whatsapp yeah will not <laughs> Uh, that, that that is uh, one of the limitation of the system okay so that's how the system is okay so these are the uh, basic feature the assignment feature i think you all uh, know about it right doctor uh, yeah the assignment feature you know yeah so Assignments, okay so the other ones are the forum and the uh, the forum and the um, uh, the forum and the feedback. Do, do you have, uh, do all the lecturers have access to uh, the link for the PHP server to track their 1732? Uh, so, but I'm a lecturer, not yet a chief. <laughs> it's okay, uh, but they should, they, can they see their server, that link, PHP link? Nora, can you please share the link in the chat window for PHP? So this is the link for PHP. Nora will share it in the in the window, in the chat window. So doctor can please um, bookmark that link. Ask all the lecturer to bookmark it, but it will only work inside UMS network, not outside. So that's the link for PHP. So the lecturer can check. Of course, now at the beginning of the semester, we all our class, all our lecture will be because of zero 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 it will be cipher. But it'll as we build the content, it'll enter into the system. Okay. So once we uh, do basic, uh, the chat session actually is a communication session. So you can uh, see in which of these three, or uh, it'll usually fit into the three, one, seven, three, and two. So chat, forum, and the um, uh, any Same as, uh, or the feedback will feed in uh, fit into the three. Two has to be the assignment. Okay, so this is about the basic systems in the blended learning system. Now, the next question I want to ask uh, Doctor and all the lecturers who are here is: Are you using the grade book in the system? The grade book. The grading. I tried to use, but I can't <laughs> understand. I can't manage manage okay. it properly, Doctor. I tried to okay. use. Okay. So this is the problem with the grade book. Now, the first question which we have to see is in our course uh, assessment, how much percentage of our lecture is actually uh, done in formative and how much is the summative? Generally, the summative, which is the final exam, will be 20 to 40. Is that correct, Doctor? Uh, I'm not so sure because. <laughs> uh... But uh, Sarip can <laughs> respond <laughs> because I'm not teaching uh, faculty of okay, okay. subjects. Okay. So, I know. Same. Yeah, based on the audit, right? Because I check all yeah. the uh, audit criteria for MQA. The final exam was earlier. Based on the earlier criteria, criteria was forty. Summative should be forty. Mm -hmm. But now it will go up to 20 also in the summative. So that means 80% of it is the formative part. So formative part can all be monitored in the learning management system. Now, if you have 200 students, you cannot do 200 uh, key data entry into the system. Every mm -hmm. <coughs> this is why I suggest that you set up the grade book. So how do you set up the grade book in the system? The grade book is set up automatically, but you need to assign a specific score to each thing. Okay, I will show you how it is done um, for this section. Okay, now <clears throat> assuming that uh, the final exam mark would be like um, 40, let's assume, and 60 marks are coming from uh, assignment, quiz, um, interaction, etc. 
let's see how we will do it here so i will add a code i will go to a i just add randomly up because system is slow i add to this i just turn editing on first Add an activity or resource. And I'm going to add assignment. Right. Okay. You give the assignment a name and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Assign one. Okay. And let's assume that this uh, assignment had uh, like Twenty marks, twenty marks out of the total of red mark. Okay. I'm, I'm just putting description so for our reference. Okay. Usually for this uh, grade book setup, right? We have to do it uh, each faculty by faculty because everyone's uh, assessment system is different. Some of them may also have the informal assessment. So in that case, again, we need to address, but. Let's just set up for uh, like a chanto. We just set up, for example. What we need to do is enable the grid. Okay, so once you complete all this assignment, you put all the thing, I will go down. I just scroll down. Okay, you need to go here, this grading button. Usually, if there are like uh, 10 participants, I usually ask them to key in or upload something and then I will give them a grade. Okay, great. The button is here called grade. Okay. What you need to do is go to your table uh, 4.2. You need to check this one, see, the grade point, and you need to give the maximum grade here. So, for example, if my table 4.2 had assignment one for 20 marks, I give here 20 marks. Okay. And grade to pass, you can give it. Uh, this usually we don't change because we don't have a grade to pass by assignment, etc., etc., etc. So this one is grade is point by default. Okay. Till the scale, we don't change all this. Now that means uh, when I do my grading of my assignment, okay, 20 marks, I will give a grade out of 18 out of 20, 19 out of 20, and so on and so forth. I don't have to do that problem of, uh, for example, of scaling down. So at the end of your, when you're going for your marks endorsement, you don't have to work with multiple Excel worksheet. You just have one Excel worksheet with everything. <coughs> okay, so you have your assignment here and you save and display. I just do it for example now. Usually you have to change all the settings for assignment, but I just want to show the grade. Now, once you have uh, this assignment done, and students have submitted, everything has been done, you can actually go to the grade book and the grader report. So this is actually the grade book set up for the grades. There's a grade here. And here is where you can get all your grades. So this is actually having post total of 20. Now, if I had assignment one, it has uh, 20 marks. Assignment two will have under 20 marks. Quiz one will have 10 marks. Quiz two will have 10 marks. So you can have all these categories here into the system. So all you, uh, you need to first create these in the 14 weeks. So 14 weeks. Uh, you'll have quiz one, 10 marks, quiz two, 10 marks, quiz three, and you have everything in one type of a system. So once you have your grade book, you can actually view here, view the grade book. Back to load. Okay, now you can see everyone's uh, 
name here. You will see your student name. Okay, you will see everyone's name here and uh, grade and the, and the mark for that particular assessment. So what you will see in your grade book is like this. You will see the mark once you assign, you do your assessment in the assignment one, you will see the marks here. Now, you, you can save yourself all the trouble of uh, doing all the keying in of data. All you do is complete, you export. After you finish your grading, at the end of the, for example, before your marks endorsement, you export here. Export. And you can export as a Excel spreadsheet here. So the entire grade book with all the students' names, the marks for each section is exported in one Excel spreadsheet. There's no need to do any more work. So all you need to do is you download your Excel worksheet and then you add your final exam marks, you add on the column and you're done. So you download here. So you can download here. So your Excel worksheet will come into your desktop. And this saves again, this is actually saving a lot of time for lecturers who don't have to go and check each and every uh, mark in the system and then key it in. This will enable you to use the system grade book. Okay, doctor. Okay, doctor, clear. One now, so please, any question? <laughs> if you have 200 students, this will save you a lot of time. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so this is the grade book set up for the system. <clears throat> now you can also export in other format, which is the ODT format, all but don't don't use those because we are generally using Excel, so it's good enough. You can use the CSV format as well if you want to change to other uh, grading system, other sorry, other uh, operating system. Like so Lina. it will open in Excel and we can print out uh, through Excel yeah, yeah. spreadsheet. Okay. Yeah, actually I use that for my student. If my class has more than 50 students, uh, I will use the direct each. Um, I will give them two assignment uh, with my co-lecturer. And then for example, two quiz, even the chat I can grade. You can grade the chat. You can uh, grade them on the chat. Uh, how many people contribute to the grade? Provided you have rubric and then you are done because save your time. So that's what is recommended. So these are the basic features which we use. We also have other features here, but uh, I think we cannot discuss uh, them such as the, uh, for example, earlier we have a feature known as the big blue button in the system. Have you used big blue button? Maybe you have attended earlier training? Never. <laughs> So there, there was earlier a system here called a big blue button, which is used by now, of course, we have WebEx, but this was an open source um, uh, online broadcasting platform here. It was, but now we don't use that anymore because we have WebEx and it's no longer uh, having the recording option. Had big blue button here. Big blue button is like a Google Meet, but this one doesn't have recording feature, but it is free to use. Yeah, anyone can use, no need to have a license for that but nowadays even google is charging a license so we are not yeah. google meet so we are limited because they have all made earlier it was a trial and error now it's become industry this was another feature here which is called h5p earlier h5p was free now it has also become a, a a paid feature you cannot use it for more than 30 days and they will charge you for it so these are our limitations with the system but we have to work within the limitations how to use grocery, doctor? Sorry? How to use grocery? Oh, grocery means this is actually a terminal, all your system of terminology in your particular course. For example, if you are teaching a course on uh, philosophy, then you have uh, different kinds of terminology of philosophy. You can actually, write, or teaching on physics, different formula, you can make a collaborative philosophy, uh, sorry, a glossary. Just like, a, it's like a dictionary of terms. So your student can actually use um, use this glossary to reference, cross-reference. Glossary is also available online. You can transfer glossary into the system. 
So different um, um, people may have different kinds of glossary. For example, one of the example of glossary may be the pronunciation of, uh, for example, in Islamic studies, the pronunciation of mm -hmm. phrases in Arabic, and that will require maybe an MP4 glossary file. So you can actually make your voice recording in a MP, uh, sorry, MP3, and then mm -hmm. you can attach it to a glossary. Okay, okay, that's right. It can be either as text or in the uh, other format or even a uh, visual format. Okay, doctor? Okay. I, I can, for this one, glossary training, we have to do it. Um, I mean, we, it's uh, has to be done slowly because we need to show you how to add media to it in addition to the, so you have a glossary and then you have entries here. So once you create a glossary, you can put in entries. So you have entries here. So uh, usually we don't apply, allow duplicate entries. So you can ask your student to populate glossary, add things to the glossary. So they will add, and then you 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 monitor, and then you uh, you add or you can control that glossary. Others people will add anything anyway. So glossary is a useful feature for if you are developing the long term uh, course, you're teaching the same subject for 10 years. After 10 years, your glossary will be extensive and contain multiple terminology. So, external tool actually refers to uh, external uh, software. This is used mostly by the IT people. They will use external tool, which means they will embed a software um, device or maybe statistical thing inside that. Doctor, I use it external yeah. tool to upload uh, attendance or be e link to students. Oh, okay, okay. But <laughs> does it work? Does it work all the time? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Usually, when my students, yes, they, will, they will ask for uh, again. They will say, "Can you open the system?" And then I have to open and share. I don't really depend on the student connectivity also. So use it for the uh, external link. So uh, this, uh, Doctor, the quiz you all know, you know how the data bank, how to create the question bank? Um, no. I go through the question bank also. Oh. Sorry, Doctor. I think to, to make quiz, uh, for me, it's difficult to upload one by one question. Oh, okay, example. okay. Yeah. Uh, th this is why many of that, there are two, re actually, again, for the quiz, this is the situation how we experience based on the user feedback. One of the things about quiz is that the quiz is running on a clock, a, a time-based system, so 10 minutes of a quiz. Now, suppose the student is on the network and the network is not fast, they will miss out certain question, and then the quiz is closed. <laughs> why many people use alternative quiz many of the lecturers use alternative quiz but within ums <coughs> when we are on the network for example the students in ashrama then you can create a question bank so for the quiz you don't have to create a question one by one you actually have a question bank feature so the feature is here it's called question bank Yeah, I wait for it to load. Okay, so this is called the question bank. So the default is here. So I create a new question. Okay. So now this one allows you to create multiple uh, types of questions. So you have uh, descriptive text, and but descriptive requires the um, you cannot do it in objective format. So this one, for example, we check select the simple, which is MCQ. And uh, this one takes time because if we have 100 questions, we'll require about two days to create. So the question name is called question on pro or false. Okay, sorry, select. Select. You have to give it a choice based on the
okay so this will be our default question name then this will be our question uh, question text okay uh, for example the seals uh, for example see i just give it a random uh, just give it for example what Doctor, can we go first in word, then we copy paste? Yeah, 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 okay. can, can, not paired or in, uh, okay, so you can, what is the best choice for best choice for? So slow, very slow. You, you, ideally you should copy and paste, but there's also another format. Okay, there's, there's actually another format, but that one again requires training. We can actually create the quiz in Notepad and we can import that format into the quiz, but uh, that requires training. And then if you miss one dot also, it's like writing program. If you miss one dot, then it'll have a problem with that. It'll again, it'll give error in the system. So this is the general feedback. We'll be thank you for answering the quiz. This, of course, you all know. So thank you for answering the quiz. This is just a general feedback. Thank you for your response. So thank you for your responses here. So this is the choice one. For, for, for example, this one, this quiz is very um, interesting. Uh, for MCQ also, you can give the grade for choice one. For example, choice one can get a full mark. And choice two can get uh, slow. The system is slow. So, for example, if you want to give choice one, you'll get hundred percent mark, means hundred, and the remaining, of course, get none. So that's the correct answer. So, again, the choice one will be, for example, A, B, and C. So you type your text here. <laughs> A text. So this one will have no, and then C next. Like I just put. So this gives multiple choices over here, so on and so forth. Dating the question bank takes time because it will be. Um, uh, but once you set it, you can randomize the questions. Are you using the randomize feature, doctor? And add more blocks. Okay, doctor. Are you using that uh, when you do the quiz? Do you random uh, randomize so that all the students see a different one? No. <laughs> oh, they will see the same thing. Okay, you don't randomize. So that's the first question is added here. So let's select a question. The, uh, select the correct choice of the question. You can keep adding questions to the uh, question bank here. Okay. So once you have set up all your question banks, I just move on to the quiz. Because I only have one question, so I can only I need at least one to add to the quiz. So then I create my quiz based on the default way in which everyone create quiz. So add an activity or resource. Add the quiz. Yes. Sorry. Move up. Okay, this is the quiz. So you just have to create the quiz first. The quiz is just a label <coughs> which you have all done earlier. Maybe I'm instruction for the quiz. <laughs> Usually instruction, the marks, and the uh, the time duration. Now, 
usually for the quiz we give them a time but the problem with uh, giving too much time keeping the quiz open they will share the information they will just whatsapp because whatsapp is faster than the server <laughs> so they will do the so usually this timing is set for the quiz <laughs> by default you should be able to set a time a time limit and usually enable the time limit. So all of these have to be enabled when you do the quiz so that the students don't have cheating in the system. So you set the time limit, 11.36 to, for example, to. Doctor, I'm sorry. I think uh, uh, you have uh, to pray. You have a uh, time for Sumbayang, right? I hope I'm not interrupting. Sorry, doctor. I can hear you. No, no, Sumbayang. Do yes. you have a pray, yes. praying oh, time? Oh, no, no. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, okay, yes. just remind me. Yes. I'll talk and talk. Yeah, yes. Sorry, because I'm watching the, okay. the system Thank is distracted because slow. <clears throat> uh, the grade. Uh, uh, here you need to set the grade and that's where the grading here becomes so you can grade it you can grade it and the grade to pass you can set and uh, allowing the system to set set the grade so the quiz also will be graded based on the scoring system so question behavior is actually uh, is related to how the question will come doctor this is the one so so this layout button right the layout is um, every question coming on new page. This is where the student again face the problem. Suppose you have 10 questions and all the 10 questions come on one page. It's a good thing because the student will see all the 10 questions in one page. But suppose you make one question per page, then the student will have problem with the time. So usually if the student has, uh, if your, your students are complaining that they have problem with the uh, web internet connection, make the layout all the question on one page. So, so not every question on one page, it should hang the system on me. Okay. So if you have for this setting or for the layout setting, internet connection is weak, you make it every 10 questions on one page. So the student only has to load one time, complete the quiz in one time and finish everything. But if you make it one question per page, the student will complain. The second one is question behavior. So shuffle within questions. So this one by default should be yes. So this means that the students will um, not see. For example, I'm sitting uh, on the quiz terminal here. My student, my other friend is sitting next to me. The questions which we see will be shuffled won't be in the same order. Okay, and then appearance and restriction. So this is where you can add ex extra restriction on attempts. Extra restriction on attempt, usually you can uh, you can block it using password. So a student cannot attempt second time unless you give them the password. Sometimes students may complain. They will say, oh, we were in the kampung and the internet was bad and we tried and we could not get through. So if sincerely, really, they are having problem, you can uh, give a password here. <clears throat> Otherwise, you can put a password restriction here. So the other student who have see this is the problem of the internet. It's creating a problem of inequality based on internet connection. Earlier, the inequality was based on the money and the wealth, but now it is the internet connection which is creating the inequality. So in that case, you can give it a password, and you can see the password, and you can give it to the student who really has problem. Real. Uh, so you can restrict access and so on and so forth. Sometimes some of the lecturers, they may put a restrict access because they want the student to actually attend the class. So they can say restrict access unless they attend the Google Meet. You can add the restriction there, here on this button. Just as I showed you earlier, you can click restrict access and add a restriction for the, for the so the student can only attend the quiz when they view the lecture one. You can add a restriction here, similar to the one which I added earlier. And this one, of course, should be completion. 
show activity as complete when conditions are met. Last one. Conditions are met when the student has to complete the quiz, then only it will be met. Save and display. Okay, so now the quiz is ready, but there are no questions. So how do you do? You add the questions. So you edit the quiz. <laughs> so the, the quiz is here, the time, everything is given, but you need to add questions. So edit quiz and add question from question bank. I only have one question, so I just wait for it to load. So, so this is where you need to add the grade. For example, your maximum grade is 10. So make sure that this one is in line with your table, uh, table 4, 4.2. So if you have given 10 marks for the quiz, you will have to select here. You add here and then you save it. You can add the questions. I just click add question bank so only have one question so i add okay so i have added the question i have edited the, the grade is here and done all and then i click on save save Let it save first, still saving. So this is the way in which you can uh, create quiz and save the content in the quiz and then deploy. Okay, so I go back to the roadshow. Okay, so these are the some of the major features we have covered in the learning management system training. Now, again, I would remind uh, the lecturers, those of you who need to register in the OER, please uh, register in OER and Laura will help you to get the uh, OER um, and, and access. So I just go back. So now we want to come back. So let's see the course again. So at this point in time, if I want to keep, like suppose the course is uh, the course is deployed at any given time, I just click analytics graph and then I see the content access and course participation. Let's see analytics graphs. So again, we look at its distribution and see I click here. So now we see the click through rate. See, you can see the number of student activities and the click through. For example, at 11 o'clock, there's a lot of click through. There's about 46 there. See, there's a lot of click through because this is showing you the number of clicks on the server. So that's what. So it's good. This is a good uh, indication of how the course progressed. Okay, so these are the basic uh, features of the course. I would uh, suggest to uh, doctor to use the grade book, grade book feature because that is one of the uh, useful feature. The second feature is the analytics feature. If you are not using those currently, use them because they will um, 
increase the efficiency of your course delivery. Okay, so are there any questions from the lecturers? Because I cannot see who's, uh, I have minimized my, uh, for the, the window, the viewer window, I cannot see who's viewing the course. Any questions are there from the lecturer? You can just turn on your microphone, you can see also see the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, would anyone like to ask any questions? Dr. Hidayah, Puan Hafiza, Dr. Sarif Adul, Dr. Saini, Dr. Sohaila. Any questions to Dr. Kenneth? Far, so far clear, Dr. Kenneth, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So uh, this is about the training for the, uh, we have covered, so usually for roadshow we cover this one. So I've covered the learning management system training. Okay, but if you need, again, if you need a specific training on specific component in LMS, please inform us. Okay, the second thing is, if you have any problem related to the system, you can email, uh, so you can email our help desk or you can call uh, Nora or Zul okay, on the number. So that uh, addresses your issue. Now, the next thing which I have to tell you all about is the OER. <coughs> Hopefully, sorry. Hopefully everybody has in your respective faculty has registered in OER. If not, please register in the OER. <clears throat> Dr. Abiba, do you know how many have registered OER? So I can ask. Uh -huh. <laughs> how to... It's okay, I will ask Nora. Just, okay. just ask around in the WhatsApp group if everyone has registered in OER. Oh, okay. Just remind them to register. We will do it slowly, but Nora, Nora can tell you how many have registered because she's as the admin. Nora, can you see how many? <laughs> we are actually trying to make everyone life easier by creating the OER, so you don't have to uh, every time upload, upload, upload. It's just link, and then you back up and restore the link. It's very easy. It's convenient. <laughs> Doctor, you want me to cover the MOCs? Because uh, MOC is uh, actually we are asking a specific, uh, I mean, what I mean is uh, the respective faculty, right? They recommend certain lecturer for MOC. So maybe uh, this may not be of interest to all the lecturers. You want me to cover the MOC and what it is? Uh, sure, Dr. Yeah, sure. You, you want me to cover MOC? Okay, because MOC, right? This MOC, what is this MOC system and how is it relevant to us in the university? Is because this MOC system is related to uh, making our curriculum accessible to the public. This is the philosophy of the MOC, making the university curriculum uh, accessible to the general public. There are multiple categories of students who may want to uh, visualize or view our curriculum. One of them is the general public, one which may be also the parents of the students who are taking the course. They may be interested in seeing the content. The second one will be the alumni, and the third one will be the lifelong learner, so LLL. So this is why this MOOC was created. So the ministry, the Ministry of Higher Education, our ministry has requested us to create MOCs. And the idea of the MOC was to create content which is open, but if the, the person who uh, views that MOC wants to get a sigil or certificate, they have to pay the university a fee for that. So this can be used as a means for generating income for the faculty. So what we have done is we have been propagating this idea of MOOC for the past two or three years in university. And now some of the faculties, uh, particularly PPST and PPIB also have submitted uh, the MOC proposal. So this is actually designed for making UMS uh, relevant because we are comprehensive university, relevant to the public as well as globali our globalization agenda. So what is the thing about MOOC which makes it different from the course? The regular courses. Usually MOOC will be, for instance, now there is a very interesting MOOC online, which is related to 
management of diabetes. Okay, so this is a book conducted by some agency, which is how to manage your diabetes without medicine. So they have in that book they teach you how to control your diet, your uh, monitor blood sugar level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is relevant to the public. So this is the type of the MOOC which allows a public to understand um, the, a system, but it has to be something which is uh, driven by the popularity at the time. For example, how to uh, be uh, get spiritual attribute or how to do how to pray during pandemic okay, how to overcome your distress or psychological problem during pandemic this kind of MOOCs have relevance in the world today in fact if you see from the global MOOC market right there's a big uh, market for what is known as the wellness the spiritual and uh, psychological wellness it's a very big market in fact in the US alone the market is few billion dollars so people are looking more and more for spiritual um, like a satisfaction or spiritual enlightenment in the MOOC environment this is why it's very important for religious MOOCs to come out okay so the topic is related to the situation so now the top usually MOOC is free and usually the MOOC is delivered over three to four weeks so the student can uh, enroll in the MOOC, they take the MOOC and it can be, for instance, how to pray properly, how to read scripture properly, how to, in, uh, how to interpret. This can be all part of the MOOC. So you're giving it from an authentic source. So it's not somebody from YouTube coming and telling you this, it's actually from the university uh, system, from a registered or a reputed person. Okay, now usually MOOCs are not paid, but Generally, uh, for income generation, sometimes MOOCs need to be paid. Usually for the MOOC, uh, the one which are online from most of the public universities are not paid because they want to use the MOOC more like a means for reaching out to public. So usually the MOOC is composed of video lecture, uh, laboratory session sometimes in case of Amali is there. It can be a in case of the physics, chemistry, biology, you have the stock footage and video and music. Okay, so there's a lot of content in MOOC. And we go down. System slow. Okay, now, how is the lecture for the MOOC? For the MOOC lecture, the, it's not like normal lecture. Uh, this, the MOOC lecture is generally 10 to 20 minutes of duration. So it, it won't be like me talking for one hour on MOOC, it will be about 10 minutes. So for example, I will already discuss one concept in one lecture, which will be about 10 minutes. So after the lecture, there will be a quiz. Okay, and after the quiz, it will go to the next lecture. And after the, after the next lecture, another quiz. So it's quiz, lecture, quiz, and lecture. So each one leads to the next one. So when they complete the entire set, there is generally a certificate issued. So we can set up our UMS Smart uh, V3 to do that for you. So once you create the MOOC, you don't have to monitor it anymore. You only have to wait until the MOOC is complete and then you can issue the certificate of completion. So as I mentioned earlier, the entire MOOC system is automated. We don't have to have any kind of written assessment. It's all by the quiz. Now, regarding the creation of the MOOC, how will you create your MOOC? Because generally what happens, right, when we are, for example, now I'm using, uh, the MOOC has to be done in a proper format. Means, like, see, for example, I, I'm uh, talking here, the, the lighting and camera, I cannot use this kind of content for MOOC because my face is not clear, you cannot see my eyes properly and things because the lighting is not proper. For, so, so for this reason, uh, PP, we have got a grant and we have got a approved uh, for the setting up a studio. We are going to have a studio here. You can come and record your lectures here. So you can record 15 minute, 15 minute or 30 minute lecture slot. And we will edit it and create the MOOC for you based on your respective lecture. So we are, have already, the tender has already been cleared. We are waiting for them to install the uh, the uh, computer system and etc. So we'll have a facility here for recording your MOOCs as well as your regular lecture. So we have to create a high quality uh, system for the MOOC. Okay, so other one is the certification. Now certification for MOOC is done by the respective faculty, institute or PUSAT. 
So it's entirely up to the uh, faculty to issue the certificate for the MOOC. But you need to set the criteria for certification. For example, to complete all the four quiz and get 80%, then only they will be issued the uh, certificate. So you can set the criteria for the certification of the MOCs. Now, we have actually done some MOCs in the system. Okay, I will just show you a MOC. So I have uh, set up a MOC system because most of my MOC I set up for the for training stuff. And we are using that as a, a template for the for our lectures. Now, this is a template I created. Okay, this template can be used for reference. You can enroll for this book. It's free for everyone. It's called Introduction to Biorisk Management. It's more designed for the biologists and scientists. But this is this will you can just enroll for it. You don't have to understand anything, but it will give you an idea of how a MOOC is actually constructed. So in the MOOC, generally what we have are the lectures. So I have put in just around five lectures here. So what the student has to do, they watch the lecture one. Okay, they, watch, they will watch this lecture. After they watch this lecture, they will complete the quiz. So they will watch lecture one, they will complete the quiz one, and then they will move to lecture two. <laughs> So the, the system will not allow them to jump from one lecture to another. Because in the learning management system, we can set up the system for you so that the student cannot skip. So once they complete all the lecture notes, okay, they will have to watch all the video lectures. Then they have to complete the assessment, which is the quiz, and then they will complete it and then they will get their sigil. So after they complete all of the quizzes, they will go and Get their sigil. So this is the you can go and view the template here. I will give you the Nora. Can you please copy and paste the link in the chat? Nora will copy and paste the link in the chat. You can go and visit it and you can view the template. So that's how the MOOC is actually created. So uh, based on the instruction from our Deputy Vice Chancellor, we actually have to produce uh, three MOOCs per faculty. So we are waiting for uh, for each of the faculty to produce uh, to give us the names of the three MOOCs. Now, if you need to produce the three uh, three MOOCs, please inform uh, Pohan Eugenia. She's your our MOOC and OER coordinator, and she will provide you with the form for the registration of the MOC in UMS uh, Learning Management System. Then we will set up the MOOC for you, and we will advise you how to do it because the MOOC has a process. First, you submit your uh, MOOC content, then we send it for review, review, review process, and then we uh, then we uh, allow the lecturer to create the MOOC in the system, and then we launch the system. So this is specifically uh, this training will be provided specifically for those lecturers who are interested in creating the MOOC. Now, what benefit is there for the MOOC for your life for the lecturer is that the MOOC is actually equivalent to one, pub, uh, one publication, it's I think 1.1 index publication. Okay, so this was how the category was in ELNPT for the previous year. I don't know if this year they will change, but definitely since it has been endorsed by Senate last time, the MOOC is counted as a index publication. Okay, but MOOC is a more work than index publication because it's a lot of uh, videography and uh, course design. Okay, okay, doctor, that's about the MOOC. Also, uh, doctor, three more courses for any courses. Uh, yes, it's entirely okay. I'll explain to this clearly regarding the MOOC. The MOOC can be of two types of MOC. One, it can be a general course. For example, the the calligraphy. You know, the, in the in, there is one university, UKM, I think. A, a lecturer has made a course on Islamic calligraphy, the Arabic script. That course has more than three to four thousand users, uh, registered users. So you need to identify the uh, subject based on two things. One is what the public wants, and secondly, based on your expertise, the expertise in your faculty. Okay, that's how the yeah. 
Hmm. It can be something of interest to you also. Uh, of interest to you also can be a MOOC, but it should be related to the the uh, faculty, faculty yeah. co value of the faculty. So okay. Uh, any so questions? You, <laughs> you will have to discuss this with your staff and then uh, make a list. No, we cannot do it at the last minute. <laughs> I mean, no. yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah, this consultation and because some of the faculty they distribute it, you know, they say, okay, this year you will three will develop, next year three, and so on and so forth. We have to plan properly, right, doctor? <laughs> yeah, it takes time. It takes it takes time because you you'll take about one month to decide the content, then under two to three months to record the content, and then under uh, maybe one month to set it up. So maybe you should give yourself six months. You can also use your existing lecture content, but I would suggest that you go and see the courses from Unimas. Unimas has a MOOC website, so you can just Google Unimas MOOC and you can see Unimas. Unimas has a lot of MOOCs. They record in the studio with the professional recording system. We will have that in PEP uh, soon. It's already on the way, actually. They have to install it before April. Okay, doctor. Okay, so would anyone like to <laughs> ask any questions? <laughs> any questions to Dr. Kenneth about MOOC? MOOC is interesting, but it's very, a lot of energy will have to be used. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, doctor. Since um, we don't have any questions, um, Doctor Sarif, Doctor Saini, any sharing, Doctor Sahila, <laughs> Doctor Hidayat, Wan Hafiza. <laughs> No, it's clear, very clear. <laughs> so, sorry, I cannot see everyone because my screen is minimized. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's okay, doctor. I, I'm actually I'm actually in the pusat, but I'm sitting in the room because I'm having flu, so they are in the other room, so I cannot yeah, see. Yeah. <laughs> I'm using the small screen. Sorry about it's okay. that. It's okay. Yeah. So, so we, we um, will. I will summarize what we uh, went through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I will yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. You need to say something, please. Sorry, please proceed. You need to ask. Okay. No, no. Silakan, doctor. Yeah. Summarize okay. so of our will, uh, session today. <laughs> okay, we will. I will summarize and we'll highlight some of the key points. So first, is the, we are actually uh, what we are looking uh, forward in the roadshow, but what we actually cover is three things. One is the learning management system. Uh, the second one is um, yeah, something wrong with my system. I stopped projecting. Huh? Otherwise, I stopped sharing. Okay. Thank you. So what we look for, what we try to do in the uh, roadshow, right, is address the lecturer's problems with the system. And what we covered today are three things. One is the LMS. One is the MOOC and one is the OER. Now, for the open educational resources, it, if all the lecturers are not here, please share the link with them and ask them to register and we will all register everyone in the OER system. Because the OER system is a good way to give publicity to the, uh, the faculty as well as to uh, link your lecture note to the learning management system. Now, the MOOC, I leave entirely up to the faculty to decide, but you will need to send us the names by this year, the three topics and three names of the lecturers. The third thing is the LMS. Okay, please utilize the LMS features which will enable you to save time because that is the objective. We don't want you to spend too much time with the technical aspect of the system. So the, the key features are one is the backup and the restore feature. So you can restore your course, no need to create content. The second one is linking your content to OER. And the third one is grade book. Use the gradebook because the gradebook will save you a lot of time, especially during marks endorsement. 
And the fourth one is analytics to track your student usage. These are the things which we highlight or we keep on telling the lecturers, please do it. Purely because of one and only one thing, because we want you to be less stress with the system and more focus on your uh, pedagogy. Okay. So thank you so much. We thank you for your time for inviting the, uh, the PEP to your faculty. Thank you for your time. And if you need any more training, please do invite us again. Okay. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> for the meaningful sharing. Terima kasih banyak, Doctor. So, uh, before we end our sharing today, please take a moment to ambil gambar lah. Ambil gambar. Uh, kita ambil gambar dengan Dr. Kenneth. Okay. We sincerely appreciate your sharing today, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Yo, don't thank me, it's our duty. <laughs> No, no need to say thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, Puan Nora, Dr. Saini, Dr. Sarip. Okay, uh, so uh, okay, Dr. Suhaila. <laughs> okay, so yeah, satu, dua, senyum. Okay. Uh, one more time. Dr. Hidayat boleh tolong ambil kah? Saya punya jadi hang pula. <laughs> okay, okay, kejap. Yeah. Uh, ni Dr. Sarip sudah ada ni, nampak Dr. Sarip ni. Hang pula okay. saya punya uh, ni, saya punya apa, laptop. Okay, saya ambil ya. One, yeah. two, three. Okay. Okay, terima okay. kasih. Terima kasih, Dr. Kenneth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really Sorry for the Webex hanging. The Webex hanging, going slow. Stay safe, doctor. Take care. Yeah, also. You also stay <laughs> Thank safe. you so much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Kenneth. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Bye-bye.